In March, NVIDIA showed off their Star Wars themed Reflections demo running in Unreal Engine using a hybrid ray tracing technique. It looked great but required four high-end Volta Architecture Tesla V100 GPUs and only managed 24 frames per second at just 1080p resolution. Clearly, ray tracing, or even just partial ray tracing, remained impractical for most people. But the point was probably to get the idea of ray tracing into people's heads more than they wanted to sell you a DGX1 for gaming. Five months later at the launch of NVIDIA's 2000 series Turing GPUs, ray tracing was again the primary focus. Ray tracing being so key to their strategy they put RTX in the product name, replacing the GTX moniker that's been synonymous with NVIDIA GPUs since the release of the 8800 GTX in 2006. And as GTX initially only represented the high-end enthusiast cards, so too RTX is reserved for the top-tier cards this time around. NVIDIA has repeatedly said the Turing architecture has been in development for 10 years. I'm suspicious of this claim. Given the rapid pace of hardware development, I'm not sure anything has ever been in development for 10 years. NVIDIA claims the RTX 2080 is designed for ray tracing. I take two exceptions to this. One, all GPUs are designed for ray tracing. Two, the RTX 2080 has very little new hardware specifically designed for this task. Let's start with the first exception. Ray tracing is inherently a parallel operation, meaning it scales well over any number of compute devices you have. In the early days, it scaled well over multiple CPUs, and then multiple cores, and it's already a perfect application for modern GPUs. In 2007, at the IEEE Symposium on Interactive Ray Tracing, Jaco Bicker published a paper titled Real-Time Ray Tracing Through the Eyes of a Game Developer. The author estimated a required 300 million rays per second to reach 30 frames a second at 1280 by 800. Good scaling was achieved over dual quad-core Xeon CPUs running at 1.86 GHz. These were relatively simple scenes with no more than two lights and 400,000 triangles. With eight cores, frame render times came down to about 55 milliseconds. Building off some of that work, a year later Intel showed a demo of Quake Wars using ray tracing. At 720p they managed around 30 frames a second, rendering over 24 cores, four 6-core Xeon CPUs. Each of these cores, reaching around 20 to 30 gigaflops, so let's assume 100 gigaflops for the system. That's pretty high, in the same performance as a custom-built supercomputer just a decade prior. 100 gigaflops is a lot less than the multi-teraflop numbers modern GPUs put out. A GTX 1080 delivers 100 times that performance. So why don't we have real-time ray tracing yet? 1280 by 720 at 30 frames a second is roughly 27 million pixels a second being pushed around. 4K 60 frames a second is a shade under 500 million pixels a second. 16.6 .6 times more pixels to worry about. So a modern GPU could handle a Quake Wars demo pretty easily, but modern scenes that we're accustomed to are far and away more complex in terms of models, lighting, shadows, transparencies, and more. Shadows, for example, something NVIDIA was making a big deal about, were hard in the Quake Wars demo because it was simply too costly to compute soft shadows back then. So we might have 100 times the performance now, but we still need to push over 16 times more pixels, and our scenes are thousands of times more complex than the simpler demos of a decade ago. GPUs are already built for highly parallel compute workloads and are great for ray tracing, with the only problem being they still aren't fast enough. So what's new in the RTX cards? Well, this brings me to my second exception. I have to question how special Turing is exactly. It looks very similar to a Volta chip, specifically the Titan V. Both cards built on a 12 nanometer process and pack almost the same number of transistors per die area, about 25 million transistors per millimeter square. Turing in the form of the 2080 Ti is physically 7.5% smaller than the Titan V with 12% fewer transistors. 68 SMs versus 80 on the V. That's 15% fewer shading cores, but with a 6% increase in clock speeds. Hypothetically, 10% lower FP32 performance than the GV100 chip and the Titan V. Both feature NVLink, both support HDMI 2.0B, which interestingly is less support for HDMI 2.1 than the Xbox One X, which at least supports a subset of HDMI 2.1 features. Before we get back into performance, let's take a closer look at that. I really find the lack of any HDMI 2.1 support rather odd. 
Rumours as far back as June circulated saying the new RTX cards would support 2.1, and that did make sense for their latest high-end product. At first I thought a lack of this support was because Turing was really just a rebadged Volta chip, which is a 2016 design, and while there still could be some truth to that, it occurs to me maybe there's more to it. The HDMI 2.1 spec was released in November of 2017, and was announced in January of 2017. NVIDIA's had 19 months of advanced knowledge about an upcoming display interface standard that would be appearing on all new monitors and TVs over the next half decade. Why then would their expensive flagship card not support this if they had so much lead time? Either they couldn't implement it because Turing is really just Volta, or they don't care about future proofing because they know they will have new products to push in 2019, or perhaps they're actively resisting HDMI 2.1 because it supports the open variable refresh rate standard VRR which competes with proprietary G-Sync. Moving on from that digression, the 2080 Ti might be down 15% in shaders, but it's only down 4% in tensor cores, having 544 versus the 640 in the V. The rest of the chip is rounded out with the 68 RT cores. Nothing so far speaks to Turing being a radically new architecture beyond adding USB-C, altering the memory controller to handle a move from HBM to GDDR6, and changing the name of some tensor cores to RT cores. So what about the tensor cores, which take up one quarter of the die area? You could use them for deep learning as originally intended, but NVIDIA is training deep learning models to estimate what a frame should look like and then post-process it to match. This is their DLSS technology. It requires they build complex models specifically for each game. You'll need to download these models once they're created on NVIDIA's supercomputing platform. It will be interesting to see how this visual quality stacks up to other anti-aliasing methods when a machine learning algorithm is taking a guess at how your frame should look. Since ray tracing is so tremendously expensive in terms of computation, it is unusable at desired frame rates and resolution. The real breakthrough that NVIDIA has been showing off has been to use their machine learning algorithms to denoise the results and approximate a higher quality scene. This again uses the tensor cores. It's a filter and not ray tracing. This leaves us to assume those 68 RT cores are the magic source which turns a GTX into an RTX. It also takes up a full quarter of the die, but RT cores don't really do any ray tracing at all. That task is still handled by the standard shader or CUDA cores. NVIDIA says the RT cores are for ray triangle intersection and BVH, or bounding volume hierarchy. BVH is the process of placing geometry into a hierarchical structure of containers. If a ray misses a parent bounding box, it will also skip any children. These are all techniques used to cut down the number of rays needed, similar to using the Z buffer in rasterization to prevent needlessly processing obscure geometry. As far as I can tell, RT cores speed up tasks associated with geometry, but the actual ray tracing itself is still carried out on the normal CUDA cores. If only rasterization was handled on the CUDA cores and ray tracing on the RT cores, you would not see any performance degradation by enabling it. In fact, with more CUDA cores on the 2080 than the 1080 series, you'd actually expect the newer cards to deliver an increase in performance, even with RTX features enabled. But that does not seem to be the case, from early reports indicating significant performance penalties when enabling RTX. Even if we expect a 100% speed up through optimizations, even a 200%, it seems 4K with a hybrid ray tracing will be a difficult task for developers to achieve. Perhaps why NVIDIA has been cagey about performance numbers. They've not shown a lot in the way of performance data and what they have shown is clearly designed to paint the 1080 in the worst possible light using 4K benchmarks where it's bandwidth starved and with HDR on. They are also using their partnership program and NDAs to control who reviews the card and how drivers are distributed which is concerning. Based on information released so far, theoretical numbers and comparisons to Volta, I speculate a 2080 would be 20% faster than a 1080 at the same clock speed. Clocks of course are a bit of an unknown at this point. Nvidia has said boost clocks are 1710 or 1800 on the Founders Edition. Partner boards could be higher and I won't speculate about those. Even though I wouldn't call it a real-time ray tracing card, it will nonetheless be the fastest GPU on the planet at release. So what about the future of real, real-time ray tracing? We know a couple of things about ray tracing. We know it's compute intensive, so we simply need more processing power. We also know this is a task that scales very well over compute devices. 
We've seen that with CPUs. We've seen that with distributed rendering servers. We see that with rendering over multiple GPUs as in the reflections demo. It was difficult for games in the past to efficiently scale over multiple GPUs and part of that problem has been legacy APIs, but it's also been a lack of incentive for developers. Only a small percentage of people ran SLI or Crossfire, so developers didn't invest a great deal of time optimizing code to scale over them efficiently. That's why outside of some edge cases, GPUs have remained monolithic while CPUs went multi-core back in 2005. Things are changing for the better though. APIs such as DirectX 12 and Vulkan give developers more freedom and more efficiently use the hardware. One current example of that is the game Strange Brigade which appears to reach 90% efficiency over multiple GPUs, allowing dual Vega 56 cards to break 100 frames a second at 4K. It's clearly possible then to write code that can scale well over multiple GPUs, but the inherent parallelism of ray tracing makes it almost the perfect application in this regard. So GPUs of the future will probably go down a path similar to the multiple chip modules we have on Threadripper or Epic discrete chip modules communicating over a high-speed interconnect. Continually expanding die size just isn't feasible from a cost and yield perspective anymore. So Nvidia is making a big play for ray tracing which is great, but almost half of the silicon on their expensive monolithic chip isn't used in ray tracing at all. This makes me wonder if other non-RTX cards actually outperform the 2080 series. I wouldn't be surprised if the Titan V came out as the faster card in RTX games, simply because it has many more CUDA cores and the BVH function reserved for the RT cores could be offloaded to either CUDA cores, perhaps tensor cores, or even the CPU. But rumors going back to July indicate AMD's next GPU fabbed on a 7 nanometer process could top out at 20 teraflops. That's probably a data center part for now, but a consumer part cut down by about 20% could potentially still outperform the 2080 Ti and at much lower costs. As fast as the RTX cards will be and as fast as their competitors' products will be next year, all of these solutions still require a hybrid approach to ray tracing. So what if we jump ahead in time a little? Sometime in 2020, we might expect a high-end PC to feature fast solid-state storage, even for the game library, twice the memory bandwidth of current systems thanks to DDR5, PCI Express 4 pushing 31 gig a second at 16 lanes, if not perhaps even PCIe 5 doing 63 gig a second. And a top end graphics card could have two to four GPU modules on board with 20 to 40 teraflops of aggregate performance in FP32. So will that be enough performance for real real time ray tracing? Oh heck no, but it'll sure make for a really nice looking approximation.